So what we see here is a nation saying this is going to do both. Tonight, the pro-pipeline movement ramps up in Edmonton, saying they can also keep the environment safe. The judge in British Columbia who's who enforcing the injunction, uh, suggesting that criminal charges, uh, you know, pursuing criminal prosecutions uh, is likely. Why the rule of law is in a constant collision course with inherent Indigenous rights. And celebrating the return of spring in the Arctic. Good evening, I'm Beverly Andrews. We start tonight in Alberta, where the oil industry drives the provincial economy. And though there are protests in British Columbia and across Canada against Kinder Morgan's proposed pipeline expansion, in Alberta, the Trans Mountain Project reigns supreme. And as APTN Chris Stewart reports, a lot of First Nations also like the project. Melanie Sylvester knows she is in the minority at this pro-pipeline rally in Edmonton because she's against it. Sylvester says pipes have broken in the past and fears another spill. When a pipe breaks, what happens? It goes right into the river, right into the land. Who drinks that? All of us. Every single person because everything flows downhill. Before the rally even began, tensions were raised. Sylvester began arguing with pipeline supporters. I don't depend on oil. I depend on water What do you heat your house with? What? Where's your homeland? Where Where you burn from? wood? Where you from? Is that what you do? Oh, but right, there's no wood left because you deforested that too. Members of Parliament and the Alberta Legislative Assembly were also at the rally. MLA Darren Billis says they will fight to have the pipeline completed. These are our resources. They belong to you. These build our schools, they build our hospitals, and they create the jobs that let Albertans put food on the table, a roof over their heads, and a good future within their reach. Alberta's Indigenous Relations Minister Richard Feehan says he has talked to every First Nation in Alberta. He says he has seen overwhelming support from the nations. And so what we see here is a nation saying this is going to do both things. This is going to give our communities jobs and it's going to make sure that we do so in the most environmentally sustainable way. Outside of Edmonton, Paul First Nation is on the pipeline route. The band signed an agreement with Kinder Morgan in 2014. Earlier this spring, Chief Arthur Rain also signed a letter supporting the pipeline and gave it to the province. He believes that the pipeline can be expanded with minimal impact to the environment and he says it helps their economy. Definitely it's a benefit to us for our own economic base. And for the environment, I, I believe, you know, we're in the era of sustainable development. And uh, whatever we do, we, uh, we protect what we're going to uh, take. Kinder Morgan says 51 First Nations have signed on to the pipeline. Now it's up to Ottawa and the premiers of Alberta and B.C. to decide if it will be built or not. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Protests against the Trans Mountain Pipeline continue at the gates of Kinder Morgan in Burnaby. The Prime Minister is returning to Canada from, a, from abroad for an emergency meeting with the, pre, with the Premier Nolte of Alberta and Horgan of British Columbia this weekend. But, again, not everyone is opposed. Here's Vancouver correspondent Laurie Hamlin with more on that. The Chiam First Nation in British Columbia negotiated for over a year before signing an agreement with Kinder Morgan. Chief Ernie Cray says he and his community made sure they'll benefit from the Trans Mountain Expansion Project. It wasn't just a drive-by meeting with Kinder Morgan and they wrote a check to my community and said, you support us, right? <laughs> Working with these young folks here on council, um, they drove the negotiations, they drove a hard bargain. Cray's concerns with the pipeline weren't just about jobs for his community. He fears for the Fraser Canyon. Cray says transporting the bitumen by railway is too dangerous. But people don't realize that if there's a major catastrophic derailment that has the, the tank, these tanker cars carrying this bitumen to tidewater, 
And these tankers would roll down the embankment in the Fraser Canyon hundreds of feet, break apart, and um, all of the bitumen uh, of, of any of the tanker cars that were breached would flow all the way down to the Fraser River into tidewater. That's a more likely scenario than a tanker. Yale First Nation also signed an agreement with Kinder Morgan. It's interesting because, um, you know, when we were approached by Kinder Morgan, we had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, community consultation and soul searching to do to, to see if this was something we could get behind. But ultimately, you know, each nation has to make that decision for themselves depending on where they are along the line. And for us, being on the Fraser Canyon and, you know, having on average probably one train derailment a year, uh, we did decide, you know, if you're going to move this product, that pipeline is likely the safest option. Although over 40 Indigenous communities have signed mutual benefit agreements, not too many people will openly talk about their support of the project. I have no guilt, no guilt when it comes to sticking up for this community and helping um, them step up from poverty. Lori Hamlin, APTN National News, Vancouver. And we would like to hear what you have to say about this or any other story. Here's how to contact us. Send an email to news at aptn.ca, like our national our APTN National News Facebook page, follow us on Twitter at APTN News, or go to our website, aptnnews.ca. As protesters over the Kinder Morgan pipeline in British Columbia continue, the human rights watchdog, Amnesty International, is keeping a close eye. And on some individuals, as some individuals risk prosecution, we ask, what are the rights of protesters? Here's Annette's story. With, here's Annette Francis, rather, with that story. According to Amnesty's Secretary General Alex Neve, protesting is at the heart of some of the most essential human rights. It's the right of freedom of expression, it's the right of freedom of association, it's the right of freedom of assembly. All of those come together to protect the right of individuals on their own uh, with close associates or in large crowds uh, to come together and peacefully protest. Neve says Canada has some of the strongest laws included in our Charter of Rights. But when it comes to Indigenous land protests, many times over the years there have been calls for concern. As we think back, uh, for instance, to the to the terrible uh, police shooting of Dudley George at Ipperwash Provincial Park in the middle of a land rights protest uh, back in the 1990s, uh, and um, and so there's there's a real need uh, to be very careful in these situations because there's other rights that are at stake as well. And in light of the arrests at two Kinder Morgan work sites, he's calling on the BC government to avoid unjustified criminalization of individuals who defy the injunction. We were concerned uh, earlier this week when there were comments uh, from a judge in British Columbia who's who enforcing the injunction, uh, suggesting that criminal charges, uh, you know, pursuing criminal prosecutions uh, is likely the preferred course of action here. Uh, so that's what we're watching carefully because we don't think that protest should be criminalized. It's a concern for Katie Perfett too. She's an environmental activist and organizer for a global organization called 350.org. She was at the security gates of the Kinder Morgan facility, supporting people to take bold action just two weeks ago. She's hoping that those who make their first appearance in court next week do not get jail time. Um, I think what's different in this case, and, and, and there were thousands of people who've shown up on Burnaby Mountain and did not, uh, did not face legal repercussions, but I think what's, it, what's uh, specific to this case is that those people knowingly defied the injunction, so they knowingly broke the law um, or broke this court-ordered injunction that was granted by the Canadian courts to a Texas-based oil company. Neve says that the protesters were not involved in acts of violence or there was no serious property damage, then criminal law should not be the route to go. And at Francis A. Patan National News, Ottawa. The Yukon Culinary Festival is serving up some delicacies. We'll get a look at what was on the menu later in the show. But first, let's look at tomorrow's weather outlook, beginning on the East Coast. Zero and cloudy in Charlottetown, more cloud and plus four in Halifax. Some snow and minus one in Cartwright, cloudy and minus 10 in Kujawak. 
Sunny and Seven in Valdor and Septios. Snow and ice expected in Toronto at plus one, sunny in North Bay and minus six. Sudbury has sun and minus five, sun and minus two in Thunder Bay. Zero in Thompson with sun, minus two and sunny in Island Lake. Some cloud and plus one in Barron's River, plus one and sunny in Brandon. Cloudy and plus three in Regina, partly cloudy and plus seven in Swift Current. Stony Rapids is at plus three and cloudy, more cloud in Meadow Lake and plus six. Friday, the Quebec Inquirer into Relations with Indigenous People heard from a non-Indigenous social worker. What emerged was a gloves-off accommodation of health services in the city of Valdor. And warning, the story contains some offensive language. Here's Tom Fenario with that story. Carole Marcille is testifying on behalf of her clients, including those that are no longer of this world. Affectionately known as Coco, Marcille is witness to daily struggles at the Val d'Or Indigenous Day Shelter, Shea Willie, where she's a social worker. Friday, she lambasted health services in the city for what she describes as negligent and racist behavior. <laughs> J'espère juste avec le témoignage que je vous fais, vous fais, Monsieur le Juge, là, que je n'irai jamais les services que les autochtones ont à l'hôpital. For one example, Marcel described calling an ambulance for a First Nations woman she found bleeding profusely in a parking lot from dozens of self-inflicted cuts. The woman was taken to hospital, only to return to Willie's place over two hours later. Why did you leave the hospital? I said I didn't leave. Nobody saw me since I'm there. Puis là, je regarde ma mère, je dis, ben non, il est venu pour almost two and a half hours. That's it, Coco, nobody came. Where were you? In the hall. And you just got up and you left? And yes, I did. Marcel's charge testimony lasted two and a half hours, during which time she criticized Valdor for its treatment of indigenous peoples. The pharmacist, local grocery store, and behavior of locals were all subjects of her ire. La vie de raciste en se levant du matin au soir, du matin au soir, du matin au soir, ça arrête jamais. Marcille said until things get better, she would like to see the city create a clinic just for indigenous people. In the meantime, she says she'll keep fighting for her clients to get fair treatment. À job, là, j'appelle ça mettre ma switch à bitch. Il met souvent ma switch à bitch. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Montreal. Leaders from Canada, the U.S., and 32 South American countries are gathering for the 8th Summit of the Americas in Lima, Peru this week. Every three years, leaders gather to discuss common concerns. For the first time, the Women's Native Association of Canada will be in attendance for the Indigenous Peoples Forum. Executive Director Lynn Grew joins us on the phone from Lima. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you very much. Um, Lynn, first off, the theme of this uh, summit is democratic governance to end corruption. What has been discussed at the Indigenous Roundtable? Uh, aside from the issue of corruption, there's been a lot of discussion on other subjects, including uh, dispossession of land, the loss or the um, inappropriate uh, use of uh, funds, pol uh, the insufficient um, uh, inclusion in the process here at the summit, the political voice of Indigenous people that's not being heard, um, the end to colonialism, and especially a lot of discussion around self-determination. So although the main subject is about uh, corruption, uh, we were quite surprised to see that many other subjects came up to the table. And what does it mean for your organization to participate at this summit? It means a lot to the Native Women's Association because we have similar issues in Canada. So we brought forth three human rights issues to the table here, one of them being the nation-to-nation -nation framework in Canada, which does not include the political voice of Indigenous women. The other issue we've brought forth is the Indian Act. So the Indian Act is a law that needs to be dissolved. It is a colonial law, and we are looking to replace that, of course, with self-determination. And one of the most important subjects for us is violence against women. 
and uh, a critical important issue of human trafficking and missing and murdered indigenous women and the inquiry and the fact that we uh, have asked for a two-year extension to the inquiry to ensure the voices uh, of all of the families are heard throughout that process. So how does, uh, how does this benefit Indigenous Women in Canada? Are you talking about all these things there? It raises awareness to other people in other countries and it lets the government of Canada know. It puts some pressure on the government of Canada to, uh, to hear our voices on the, in, within the country and uh, to, uh, to, listen, to listen to us. And we're hoping that we will eventually be at that nation to nation table where we have been excluded uh, in the last year and a half. Well, well, that was great to hear, Lynn. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to speak with us. Thank you very much. Many students in the Northwest Territories are not reading at a level appropriate for their age. But thanks to a fly-in book fair, students in one remote community are able to access new reading material. APTN Char APTN's Charlotte Moore Jacobs spoke with students and educators at the event. Students at Mezzi Community School in Wati, Northwest Territories, are eagerly selecting from a new batch of books. The books, which are free, come from the Books and Homes program funded by De Beers, a major mining company in the territory. What grade are you in? Three. Three. And do you like reading? Yes. Perfect. Why do you like reading? Because uh, reading is good and it can help me learn more words. Teddy is one of 120 students in the school. His reading is strong, but that was not always the case. He started learning his sounds, decoding, uh, and then he got his fluency going and his uh, comprehension, and he loves reading now. Principal John Serapicness says that northern students do not always have access to the right types of books that entice them to read. Are they behind, I would say, maybe sometimes because they're, they're not reading about things that they're not familiar with. Um, whereas if they start reading about uh, local communities, just now they were reading about uh, Hay River and places like that, and they're, they're more interested in that kind of, uh, in that context. The last data on literacy in the NWT dates back to 2003. It shows three quarters of NWT residents who read at the lowest level are Indigenous. On top of this, youth in the NWT are at a lower reading level than the national average. Wati's community-wide emphasis on reading is hoping to make those stats a thing of the past. But they would just look at some books, maybe some pictures, and pick out three. And now they're more, more uh, di uh, discerning as to what they're going to pick, you know, they, because they can read the titles, they can read first page or two. Patsy Wittrade in grade five is a prime example of this shift, reading with her family. She reads me books before bedtime and then I've been looking before when I when my mom goes and she closes the door I open the lights and try to read it out myself. That's how I've been trying to learn. De Beers Flying Bookstore will visit a total of 14 schools across nine communities. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Wati, Klitschel Territory. Spring celebrations are underway in Iqaluit. This year, a special guest joined the festivities. We'll find out who after the break. But before we get to tomorrow's weather, here's a sneak peek at another story we're working on. I'm Shirley McLean in Whitehorse. Coming soon to APTN National News, a culinary campfire cookout. Fire just adds flavor to food. Like it's just, it's fun, it's flavorful, it's unique, and, and obviously it's culturally appropriate. So um, that's why we want to come out and play around. And we've got this great big fire pit here. And uh, and again, all the chefs love to play on the fire. And well, I've just had the first bite ever of seal. That is the most amazing piece of meat. I love the way it feels within my teeth. Like it has a, a different bite. And it's delicious. It's delicious. Cloudy and high level and plus 10, sunny and plus 4 in Grand Prairie. Partly cloudy and plus 7 in Edmonton, Calgary also cloudy at plus 12. Quinnell part plus 9 but cloudy, more cloud and plus 11 in Vancouver. Smithers is cloudy and plus seven, a bit of sun, and plus and also plus seven in Fort St. John. Minus 11 in cloud in Old Crow. 
Wrigley has cloud and minus 5, cloud and plus 4 in Yellowknife. Some cloud and minus 19 in Saks Harbor, cloudy in Inuvik and minus 15. Chesterfield is at minus 12 with sun, more sun in Baker Lake, minus 10. Cloudy and 13 in Cape Dorset, sunny and minus 21 in Resolute. Night owls beware. New research shows staying up late may carry certain health risks. The study by Northwestern University and the University of Surrey tracked about a half a million people over six and a half years. Researchers found those who identified as evening types had a higher risk of dying earlier than those who identified as morning people. The study also found night people are at a higher risk for ailments such as diabetes, psychological disorders, and digestive disorders. Support for the Humboldt Broncos is, for the Humboldt Bronco, sorry, is spanning far and wide. Across social media, people are sharing photos of hockey sticks placed on porches. A photo sent in by Sherry Moray gives an Arctic take on the movement. The photo shows hockey sticks not on porches, but, the, but on the iconic Inukshuk in Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. Thanks for sharing. If you have a photo you'd like to see on APTN National News, email them to share at aptn.ca. You can also follow APTN News on Instagram to see more featured photos. A Callaway celebration for spring is underway. Last night was the official quick kickoff of the 53rd Tunic, Tunic Time Festival. It was a full house at the Akalawit Curling Club at the Anishinaab, as the Anishinaab High School drummer, drum dancers kicked off 10 days of activities, concerts and fun with one special guest. Governor Ju General Julia Paya was in attendance to be named Honorary Tunic, sort of a ceremonial ambassador for the festival. She even tried to speak in Nuktitok. Tunga Suwitsi Tunic Time 2018. I am very honored to be to be with you tonight. That wraps up the APTN National News for this Friday. As we mentioned earlier, Governor General Payout was in Iqaluit to kick off the 53rd annual Tunic Time Iqaluit Spring Festival. The, the Anishinaabe High School drum dancers were on hand and we have some of their throat singings to send you into the weekend. Thank you for watching.